let me say a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. Well, it's interesting, that, so that's the kind of intellectual background. Um, and a lot of natural science came from that background. It's a myth that sort of all of natural science sort of sprung into existence in the early modern period or during the Enlightenment or something. In fact, almost every interesting uh, insight you can find somewhere, at least in, in uh, seminal form, in these, this period. What happened, um, and this is a long, complicated story, is that at some point, um, many people came to think that this kind of scholastic understanding had gotten decadent, that certain ways of explaining things were not all that useful. And it's like, why does this rock fall to the ground? Well, it's the final cause of the rock is, you know, to move toward the earth or something like that. And it, so that doesn't seem to explain all that much. And so um, two people, uh, Francis Bacon and, and Rene Descartes, actually said, basically, let's divide reality. This is, this is my words, but they said, let's, let's kind of uh, partition off these things and let's banish formal and final causes from our explanation of nature. They didn't say from science exactly, but that's basically what they're after. Now, Descartes actually denied the existence of formal and final causes. Don't, they don't, essentially don't exist. But Bacon said, yeah, they exist, but we're not going to deal with them here. Uh, maybe, you know, metaphysicians will deal with them or something like that. Now, even if you read the Catholic Encyclopedia from, you know, the 1911 article on cause that discusses these things, even that article says, okay, there was a certain kind of scholastic decadence that needed to be challenged and critiqued. And what we've discovered, of course, in, in modern science, all sorts of things in the natural world that no one knew anything about, all sorts of ways of explaining things uh, with mathematical formalisms that no one knew anything about. That's all wonderful. Um, maybe it's true that, that this needed to happen in order for those things to be discovered. I'm a little skeptical. I don't think it had to happen. But in any case, it clearly led to an extreme overreaction because it essentially cut off two very important things that we need really ultimately to explain things. And so you wouldn't be surprised to learn that in the practice of natural science, these causes under other names kind of kept reappearing. Um, if illicitly. And so when you read Isaac Newton, who is, it, is in, sense, in a sense kind of an anti-Aristotelian, nevertheless he was very critical of the Cartesians and did not want to sort of collapse into a purely kind of mechanistic or materialistic explanation of the world. And so though he's credited with the laws of motion and extending the mathematical explanation of the world farther perhaps than anyone else prior to him, Nevertheless, here's what he says in his Principia, in the General Scolium. He's talking about the, the solar system. He says, Though, the, though these bodies may indeed continue in their orbits by the mere laws of gravity, yet they could by no means have at first derived the regular position of their orbits themselves from those laws. Thus, the most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. Unlike Darwin, who, when he wrote The Origin of Species, did, in a sense, if you read the argument, see himself as getting God out of the life business. I mean, he's lots of arguments. Here's this thing. God wouldn't have done it that way. It must have been the result of this process I'm talking about. There's nothing like that in the Principia. In fact, Newton thought he was securing the sort of place of this. He was creating a kind of mechanistic explanation. And the source for that mechanism would have to clearly be uh, a transcendent God. That's at least how he understood it. Now, I didn't work out all that well. But notice what he's doing, even in anti-Aristotelian context, He's appealing to purposes and design and things like that. And then William Paley in The Watchmaker, as Mike Behe mentioned briefly, uh, widely read in the English-speaking world, he describes this watch resting on a heath. And here he does something interesting. Paley does talk about evidence of design in the cosmos, but he focuses largely on the intricate configuration of the parts of organisms that seem to work together for a purpose, much like a watch. So you see a watch with different interacting parts, and he thinks that that should lead you to conclude that there's a, there's a benevolent God, or certainly a God. Um, so pa Paley did focus on order, but he also focused on what we might now call complexity, some sort of purposive complexity.